This is a recorded presentation from our WordPress meetup for WordPress St. Petersburg at the Suncoast Developers Guild. Please allow me to introduce Nichelle Gerardo for her presentation of UX 101, Understanding the Fundamentals. So instead of giving you guys a full resume, which I can find on LinkedIn if you really want to learn about me and my career, I'm just going to give you a synopsis. I thought these images better represent who I am in a little bit. So if you want to try to figure it out, but I was introduced into UX about 10 years ago at Allied Bike. Before that, I was doing web support here and there, doing bits and pieces of UX, but not fully immersed. And when I went to Ally, I was able to work on websites. I worked on their app development and using a full scale UX project and then a couple of other things that I was doing at the time. From the images, the most important thing I think you should know about me on the images is that I'm a Pisces. So that goes to my yin and my yang. That's why I say I'm 75% analytical, 25% creative. So that's UX is right up my alley. I love upholstery fabrics. I actually used to have a store where I did the work and I actually had a poster store, so I love that. And my namesake, Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant O'Hara on Star Trek. My mother was like, you were destined to have that name and be something great. That's a lot, but I love it. I think I want to, when I reach her age, I want to look like her. So that's a little bit about me. Tonight, we're actually going to dive into the fundamentals of UX. I think there's a lot of terms and words people hear, but not understanding foundationally what really is UX. What does it mean? What are those things that make up UX? And then a little bit on some of the resources and tools that are out there and how you can apply it to your websites or any digital project you may be working on. And some of it, you may even say, hey, I might find out how to apply this to my business or other areas of my life as well. So the framework, background, what is UX? We're going to talk a little bit about the pillars of UX, dive a little bit more into what is methods, policies, laws, and then also workshop, if any, sites. So UX is literally user experience. It was brought to us by Donald Norman, who was a former U, uh, UX architect at Apple. Uh, when he went there in 93, it was an environment of the R&D shop and then the human interaction team. And he was like, wait a minute, all of these working together is something greater that we really need to be paying attention to. And his first article, he coined the term UX. So that's how we got there. So what is UX really? It's a process. It's not a methodology. It's not this or that. It's not hocus pocus. It's a broad, holistic process, and it's really addressing the visual with the functional at the same time. And as you do UX, you should be asking yourself some key questions of what is the value that I'm bringing to my users, whether it's an actual product, they're interacting with your company, or it's just basically your site. Will people really start using my site or my product? Is it fun and engaging what I'm presenting to them? And is it easy for my users to complete their task? So always keep these questions in the back of your mind. And the process is called design thinking now. That's the new term that's floating around out there. I scratch it out and I say UX thinking because I think when people hear the word design, they think of the visual and it's greater than that. Um, when I started, it was called the iterative creative process. You can still see it out there a little bit using those terminologies. But basically, you want to empathize with your users. So go to your customers, listen to them. What are they telling you? Then go back and say, well, based off the information they provided to me, how do I define that and restructure that to something that they can really use? Then I will say, well, based off of that, definition, my customers, how do I turn that into a solution? Or what solution should I be looking at that my customers really need? Once you figure out and hone in on that one particular thing, you may say, okay, I'm ready to prototype it. Whether it's an app, it's a site, maybe it's a, a hard tool that you have. 
I need to prototype this and then go back to those same users and test them on it and say, hey, you told me this was your problem. Does this meet your need? And if the answers, if you go through it and you get your answer, you're looking for it, one of two things that happen, you'll say, okay, yes, this is really something people need. Let me go out, go forth and make this come true. Or you'll say, well, no, I missed something. Let me go back in the process. This is not a linear process. At any point in time, you can stop and decide and say, I need to go back and I need to start over again. So with that, from UX thinking, you go into what are the really the five pillars of UX? And this is kind of universal. Uh, is research, is strategy, is accessibility, is design, and is development. And those five things that I spoke about before in U.S. thinking directly applies to these pillars. So with research, we're saying that it informs our work, it improves our understanding, and before they have validate our decisions, I actually said it should lead your decisions. It shouldn't, you shouldn't just say my gut reaction tells me and do it. You actually should be looking at your research and saying, Oh no, this is what it's telling me and this is where I should be going. So with UX research, it's really a systematic investigation of your users and what they want. You can use it and gather it either by quantitative or qualitative methods. Uh, so as simple as some people do surveys and they say one, two, three, or tell us what you like. And then you analyze that information as saying in real world, real time information. Uh, this process uh, was kind of defined by uh, Aaron Sanders at Frog. And it was a simple way to actually see the methodology and how you should go through the process and work. And also understand that once you hit your, uh, your conclusions and you get your results, the thing you want to do is to publish that information out and share it with the masses because it does no good for you to keep that information to yourself because people will then start reinventing the wheel. So share. As you do it, share. So methods, methodology. Uh, personas, uh, you'll probably hear a lot of talk about personas. Those are basically who is your customer and it's definitely deeper than just saying demographics we're beyond just saying age race size we're actually saying that jim true is my user he's a 55 year old male who yeah, loves you <laughs> <laughs> <So> sorry <laughs> well 52 year old male who loves dogs who works at home and i take that and i will apply it to is this person really my core audience that I'm building this tool for or should it be somebody else? And you go through that and you define who your personas are. Some people have about five personas they deal with to keep it controllable and that they know who they're looking for, especially when you go out to do your research. Um, you can team up with, there is marketing firms, uh, research firms who actually does this. Um, I actually found in my studies that uh, University of Central Florida actually has a UX lab that they are looking for people, companies to come to them with projects so they can help their students learn more real world activity with projects. Uh, you can also do usability studies. How are people able to use your website? What are they doing? How are they flowing through the site? Uh, you've heard about A-B testing. A-B testing is how do, if you tweak that one little thing what is the response from it? Uh, there's a guy, uh, I can't remember his name, but he was over Trump's digital, and I just think it's amazing, he was over Trump's digital campaign for presidency. And he knew nothing about web development UX, but he took advantage of the social media people who were available for free to all the candidates. And he said they showed him how to do A-B testing. And he said he tweaked one little 
social media campaign and instead of having saying Donald Trump's face on it, have Hillary Clinton's face on it and use certain keywords and they could tell immediately how people were responding to it and they actually saw it transfer to dollars. So A-B testing is what is those one little thing that you may need to tweak on your site or in your email that you send it to your customers that you can do and see, well, if I have this button blue and I turn it to red and present it to this particular audience, how are they responding to it? A-B testing is a great way to do that. Analytics, Google. Google Analytics is a tool that should be associated with everyone's website. I don't care when, how, or what, you have to have it on there because Google Analytics will tell you what is the traffic on your site. What are people responding to on your site? What are they clicking on? And the data is there. You can slice and dice that data any which way you want to. And it's great because what it will do is in the long term, it will tell you, I may need to look at this flow process flow on my website, or I need to pay attention to this page that I think is the greatest page, but my nobody's responding to it or engaging with it. And analytics it is, I would say, pay attention in the next year because there's about to be another major change with Google Analytics, and that is is that between video and voice. That's the next major trend that's coming through with analytics. So just keep in mind, these are just a few other things that you can do from a research perspective is much bigger than this. I'm actually going to be taking some online classes to understand how to do surveys better because we think we know how to do surveys, but it's really a science to it and I want to get better at it myself. So this is actually the uh, Google Heart framework mm -hmm. that they've come up with when they do their research. And I was just on a webinar with the young lady who actually used this. She was from Google and she presented this to us. And it was amazing. It gave amazing insight on how Google decides to do some of the projects and the things they do and release into their environment. Um, a lot of companies are beginning to use this as part of their framework. And what she said with HEART is, is that uh, each of the letters is an acronym and that you should choose no more than two to three of the these uh, meet, uh, metrics to actually test on your with your digital product or within your company. And an example of this is adoption. I just pulled this directly from somebody else's PowerPoint. They were is about enrollment, and they said, "Well, what is the adoption of our users, and how are they experienced? What is their experience?" So they said their significant insights would be that users are viewing the price on the site. Um, they're going to sec the section to actually enroll in the site, and their failures would be that they exit the page without doing any purchases or anything. And they'll be looking at their measurements as through click on the price button, which goes back to Google Analytics, click on the enrollment button, Google Analytics, and then their target, their user target is actually who is that persona that you identified early on. Uh, for them, it was students, uh, non-current, not non-students. And they only had a short window, it was 24 hours, a 24 hour cycle. So you don't even have to do your research for long periods of time. A lot of people think that's a misnomer. A lot of people think, oh, I have to do it. Some research is simple as taking a piece of paper, going to your coworker and say, give me some feedback. And then you can go more in depth with, we did a diary study when I was at Ally where it was over a two week period. And we asked our users to log in twice a, twice a day to document how they're using their mobile app. So it can be what you, how you need. So strategy, we're gonna dig a little bit more into, it said the crossroad of design and business strategy, which is true. Um, I thought this Dilbert uh, comic strip was great because it's exactly what happens. Somebody comes to you and said, uh, here, here's my requirements document. Go build me a site. And you look at it, it's like, man, this thing has 400 <laughs> items on it. <laughs> Get real. And he's like, this is too complex. 
he was like, yeah, make it easy to use. It's not that easy. <laughs> so if you have a strategy, we're actually looking at goals versus actions. Don't tell me how to build your site. Tell me what you're trying to accomplish with your site. We're looking at ideas over a to-do list. What are the ideas? What are the feel? What are the things you want to happen in your site? Then also to understand that strategy has, what is your business strategy? What's the goal of your business? Because your site does not come before your business. That's putting the cart before the horse. What is the purpose of your business? What are you trying to accomplish with your tool? Then what's the value? What's in it for your end users? Why should they use it? What value does it bring to them? Then you go back to research. You put it before them and say, hey, is this really working the way I want it to work? Are they responding to it the way I want them to respond to it? What should I be tweaking or looking at? What's good? What's bad? What do I need to check on? And then killer UX is once that's done, go and build it. When you build it, make sure that it's incorporating these things that they tell you they really want. So some of your focus areas of UX strategy may be content. We talked about that with Charles, what that was two to a month, about a month ago. So beginning of September. September, yeah. Charles had a great topic on how do you write compelling stories and articles. And you can go back and find that on the WordPress site. Then two weeks ago, we just talked about information architecture and how do you decide what information you're going to put on your site. You uh, competitive analysis in my current position. Uh, I was in the door all of a month and they said, hey, do a competitive analysis about our site versus our competitor site. And then I was like, OK, I didn't know who the competitors were at that point because I was relatively new. And not only did I do that, I also looked at other companies that had similar business models to our current, my current company, which is a B2B. And I pulled on my experience from the fabric industry, which is a B2B model. And I looked at their sites and what do they have and how do they present their products and was able to say, well, from our direct competitors, this is what they're doing. But other B2Bs, this is some of the things they're doing on their sites that I think may be good on our site. It could be as simple as that. Oh, and also, if y'all have questions, please feel free to ask at any point in time. I'm sorry, I should have put that in there at the very beginning. Uh, a UX strategy blueprint, I actually pulled this directly off the web. Um, most of my graphics and information, if you type in UX and either strategy design, you'll see all of these graphics from right out of there. Um, and this is real easy. Somebody, I uh, can't remember who, somebody who does this for a living said, it should be able to sit on one page. It should be as simple as one page that you can pass around to your team members and everybody can come back to. It doesn't have to be this long, complicated document, but something that everybody can use as a point of reference. And as you can see, their measurements, you know, they talked about global markets, online channels. They said scale to win, all these big things, innovate business model. But the main thing is they're trying to increase retention and profitability. And this is just a small example of a content strategy. When you put it out there now with video being such a big part that we're using, we really need to be aware of how we're using content to pull people in to us, to, to know more about us. And you don't use content to sell the product. You use content to engage your customers. That's really what we're looking at from your website It's more of an engagement thing. They want information. They want to know who you are. What are you doing? How do you give back to the community? Do you have engaging videos? Don't, they don't have to be long. They can be 30 second snippets or if you have how to videos, they can be as long as you need them to be to present how to's, but it has to be engaging. So then that way, when the customer look at you or your users look at you, they'll say, you know what? Such a such site is the authority on X, Y, Z. And that's how we want to use it. And actually, I think this is a good infographic on content strategy in general. So it'll be in the presentation, also a link to where I picked it up on the site if you want to dive into it a little bit more. Accessibility. Is usable to everyone regardless. I want to say this is the pillar of UX that gets ignored the most, but it has the greatest impact 
because there are there are laws behind this. You can be sued for this. And when we talk about accessibility, we're talking about ease of use, regardless of visual, auditory, mobility and dexterity, and cognitive issues. Uh, cognitive issues, people tend not to think about because they're not right in your face, but somebody who has seizures has to be, can't be on a site that's blinking. So if your images are moving really fast on your site, that doesn't work for somebody with a cognitive issue because it can induce a seizure on them. Uh, visual, so if you have somebody who is blind, they're using a tool called JAWS and it actually reads your sight. And I don't know if you ever had the opportunity to hear JAWS and work, it's crazy. It moves so fast, it reads so fast. It's, it's like a hyperspeed reading. Uh, it's it kind of runs even faster than somebody who's calling an auction. Think of an auction call. It's, it's really, think of an auction call and how fast they're talking. That is literally how fast or faster JAWS is moving. Auditory, now you have a TTY, is uh, those who are uh, audio impaired, and then mobile and dexterity. They should be able to use your site without using a mouse. So it's your control keys, your function keys, your, move, your movement keys are your site. Do you have control P for simple for print? Do you have control C, control V, copy paste? Those type of things are already in place on your site and people are able to use. Um, the principles of these is uh, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And the more that you address these four things, the better your site will be. A lot of times we think mobile first when we build sites now because it has to be able to use on a mobile site or whatever. Actually, you should be thinking accessibility first, then mobile first. Because accessibility, if your site can be used by everyone at any point in time, the rest of it will flow in easily. Can I you sure. A sure. <clears throat> are you are you utilizing Google AMP pages with the sites that you're building? No, because I'm not a developer. Um, I guess I should more say that I am actually more of a generalist researcher, strategist for UX versus a developer. There are tons of tools you can. Um, speaking specifically to CAN, I can't, unfortunately. Does anybody have CAN experience in here? Because veto it? Yeah. Well, I was just curious yeah. if that would fit into your strategy. But it, uh, yeah, and what I would say. And what I would say is that if you have a question, more than likely it's been addressed online because the UX community wants people to get it. And there's a lot of white papers now that are free before you used to have to pay for. There are a lot of white papers like the Google Heart Framework is white paper for free. So I would say go, uh, you can Google it and they're probably more than likely you'll find somebody who dealt with it. Are you a developer looking for it? Yeah, yeah, so a tool? No, we're we're using Google AMP pages in, in all of our websites and I mean it's just very minimalist on mobile devices. Mm -hmm. And so the UX is not completely different, but it's very different from mm -hmm. the desktop version. And so anyways, I I was just curious how that might into this strategy. Well, and I, and I would say if there's a difference between the two, you need to look at your at least your basic functions and make sure they work the same and on both. Because if it's the, a vast difference between the two, you're they're not, it's not accessible. Sure. And so if you've got a form and the form can't work the way the form's supposed to work and the Google Internet page, then you've got a problem. Yeah. So I, that's, uh, I would say that. The, also, the other thing is, the great thing is, I don't know if you have friends, but there are a lot of organizations uh, with the different, uh, different abilities. They are happy to work. Um, before I moved here, when I was in Savannah, uh, one of the gentlemen, he was blind in my church. And through his organization, I had them test some things for me, and they were happy to do it. 
because the more it fits for their needs, they become your users and sellers also. And they're happy to test those things for, for nothing because they want things to be built for them. So I would say between those two, making sure that your basic function between the two are exactly the same and they work how they're supposed to, flow the way they're supposed to, and then having somebody with that, uh, with a different ability test it for you, then you should be able to come up with your strategy. Okay. Sure, Tar can't be a better. No, that's, that's fine. <laughs> uh, policies and laws. So the UN actually started the whole the rights of a person with a disability, and from there it flowed into the WCAG, which uh, most people know about an acronym, but it's the Web Content Accessibility Guide. They're on the two version 2.0. Uh, but they don't change it often. It, I think the last change was made a few years ago. It's, it's almost like every two, 10 years. It's a consortium of UX people around the world who contributes to this guideline. And this is the basis for just about anything dealing with accessibility, even to the standpoint of some of your everyday uh, accessibility things we don't even think about. It actually comes from them too. And then the law that is on the book um, the, with the ADA, they actually have standards for accessibility design, um, design. And when Dixie was actually sued, and a couple other people have been sued as well, as far as their websites not being um, accessible. And the when Dixie case, it was actually, I want to say it was a blind customer who sued them because his uh, JAWS reader could not read the site and he could not do online shopping. And from that, they came some very def definite guidelines on what you principles, what you should be doing on your site. And your site should be at a minimum meeting those. And if they're not, you could be in a world of hurt, especially if you want your product to grow. Uh, sure. I'd just like to add that mm -hmm. there's actually been hundreds and hundreds of lawsuits. That's true. Especially, you know, uh, going beginning of the year, some huge companies like Amazon and Nike and mm -hmm. Rolex, huge, huge companies. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And, that, and that's the thing because even though I think they said that it's something like two trillion people around the world that have some type of form of disability. So, and because the internet is around the world now, especially because you have translation tools, you have to be able to accommodate those people. And that's why I say it should be accessibility first. If you have that in your thought, as you're building out, as you're going through your strategy and you're building your site or your product or your app, it becomes easier because it just becomes second nature as you do it. We cannot get away from these people. They show up everywhere, the Kardashians. <laughs> when, <laughs> when Kim the Kardashian site first launched, this is what it looked like. She likes that beige, either they're beige or they're black and white is how they function in their color palette. And she was beige on beige on beige. And it was awful. I who can see, no contrast. I who can see can't see this. And she even blends in with her own background. The only way she stands out is because of her hair color. So there was a suit. She kind of was sued. Somebody actually went to them first and said, hey, your site is not accessible. We may sue you. And they fixed it. So this is what it looks like now. As you can see, her navigation bar is in the white. The color is a little bit more contrast. The, light, the colors are lighter. And they added three different skin tone people on there. Yeah. <laughs> so going into design, we're not making things pretty just for the sake of making things pretty. So if somebody comes to you and say, I want to revamp my site, it's just the color is ugly. You be like, wait a minute, why are we really revamping your site? Why are we really touching your app? UX design is you're actually anticipating user behaviors by creating engaging, aesthetically pleasing, interactive digital products that are easy to access, understand, and use. That digital products part, you can change it out to whatever. And I came up with that definition because I tell you, I looked high and low and I could not find a definition that I liked at all. Because the definition either focused so much, so heavily 
on UX in general or so heavy on design, there was not a combination of the both. So I took three different definitions and came up with my own. And when you're doing UX design, you're addressing the why. What's the motivation, the value? Why are your customers going to be on your site? What's the value to them of their site? The functionality, how does it ebb and flow? Does it, do you, can, can you get to the cart in three pages versus two pages? And accessibility, aesthetics. Then you think about the aesthetics. Am I using the right color? Is it my branding? Those, those type of things, style guide things that you probably heard of. And actually UX design has two components is UX design and service design. Um, most companies that are more service oriented, you hear more of them say, what's the customer experience? Uh, they focus on the customer that way, whereas UX design is more of the information architecture. How is this information organized on the site? How does it flow? How does it move? Is there a brick wall somewhere that somebody's going to bump into that's going to stop the ease of use? Whatever the end game you want for your app or tool. So Netflix actually was on a webinar with them. This is their old page, homepage, Netflix. And it was a static image of the show that you were on. It was a little bit of text about what is the show. And if you wanted to go back to the homepage, you had to know to scroll up. And a lot of people didn't know you scrolled up. So everybody was like, how do I get back to home? How do I get back to home? So you want to hit the home button on your thing. So in late 16, 17, the early 17, they started reevaluating what are they going to do with the new design, the new iteration of Netflix. And this is what they came up with. This is, um, sorry for the graph, uh, the image I was trying to capture, but everything else is moving video. So what they did was they enlarged the image. And not only is the image, it's a 30 second video loop that's more of a trailer. They actually put the navigation back on the left side, which people are used to, the navigation being on the left side. The, the title is actually larger and they made it easier for you to either play or get more information. And then also they did the same with their first row of the images when they do either originals or suggestions. You'll see those kind of move as soon as you land on them, they move. They're, they're, they're not static anymore. And this all came from a combination of their user research and then also looking at their information architecture and saying this is not flowing the way we thought. They actually did a heat map and seeing where people were, were landing and moving on their site. And that's how they were able to come up with some of this. So development. Now we're really bridging the gap between design and technology. And throughout this, don't think you only fall into one area. You can be doing all of these. I call myself a jack of all trades and a master of some. I'm a jack of all trades when it comes to UX. I call myself a master when it comes to research and strategy. Yours may be a little bit different. When you get to development, you're really taking, I have a little bit of visual creative. I understand that a little bit, but that's not my key thing. Coding back in development is really my key. And I will work with, I may sit with the creative team but I'm more working with the technical team and helping the creative team understand that te technically that's not possible. Redo the design or going to the dev team and, or the truly technical back end team is saying, hey, can we have these components and pull in that information? Uh, that's where I kind of sat when I was in the banks. Uh, I was more technical. I was the analyst. I actually had the title of an analyst versus a developer. Uh, and I will work with them and say, okay, technical team, creative team, these are the business requirements. This is what our business owners want, build and design. And then I would take those sketches, mock-ups, and I would go to the technical team and say, is this possible? And they'll say, no, 
and then I'll go back to the creative team. Mm -hmm. And this is a kind of really where uh, UX development sits. Um, so some of these people may have the title of UX architect, UX developer, you'll see front end developer, those type of things. And that's where they're really focusing. Um, a lot of them do prototyping, uh, as I said, front end development, and then your quality insurance. A lot of them, they are actually hands on testers as well. And just to represent, you go from sketch, wireframe, mock up to something real. Your, your de uh, develop, UX developers can be a designer or a developer. Um, they can fall in either one. They're usually better at one versus the other. Uh, when you talk to them. Yes. Do you know of, or does anybody know of a good wireframing tool or have suggestions for that? I use Sketch. Sketch. Yeah, yeah. Sketch and InnoVision. Um, well, there's a was it Envision? Envision. Envision. Yeah, Envision is a good one. Um, if to get started, you want to play around, that's a Lucidia. Yeah, that's Charts cool. is the other one. Um, that's actually what I use. I actually, I'm a, I'm a hard copy person. I'm a really, I'm a pen to paper type of person. And at one point, early on, uh, I actually was using PowerPoint to do my wireframes at one you point. Can. Yeah. yeah. Which two do you recommend for Marco? Like after five. Um, actually, uh, for these um, Envision, some of the same tools that you're going to be using for wireframes, you can use for mockups now too, because they realize that they go Figma. hand in hand. Figma is the other one. Figma. F I G M A. It's cross platform, so it's Windows, Linux, and Mac. Mm -hmm. uh, Sketch is Mac only. I don't know yeah. for you too on those. I use Adobe XD all the time. Yeah, yeah. So experience design. So this you're familiar with Adobe products already. Yeah. Yeah. You can hop into XD. Just can't afford Adobe products. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> your company's paying for your yeah. Adobe Creative yeah. Cloud account. Exactly. <laughs> and I was going to say on the back end of this, I have a resource and tools list. Um, by no means is it exhaustive, but it is the things that I've seen used the most um, through the companies that I've been with. So here it is. <laughs> Speaking of which, um, so resources. So when you start looking out, uh, when you start thinking research, uh, third party research, and there's tons of data out there, there's Nielsen Norman Group. Guess who founded that? <laughs> Donald Norman. He founded his own company when he left uh, uh, Apple and started that group. And they have tons and tons of user studies that you can use as a basis to start any of your uh, UX uh, research. Forrester, usability.gov. Uh, the next couple of slide, uh, companies, UX uh, sites are actually sites. UX Matters, UX Booth, UX Planet, uh, UX Strategy by uh, Levy is really good. Um, a lot of people, that's a lot of actually the strategy, almost the entire strategy section came from this book. Uh, w3, uh, W3C, ADA.gov, um, you have interactiondesign.org, Envision, uh, they have some great webinars. I was just on a last week UX research webinars. They had people from Google, there was some Netflix. I mean, some top tier companies that she was like, ooh, that's what you're doing. And then, uh, like I said, UCF UX Lab. Um, if anybody has a major project that they want to use and maybe from what I understand is that if you go to them and present, they will work with their students to come up with the project and they will run the whole study for you and just working and you become their customer. Uh, tools, Google Analytics. LexisNexis, good old LexisNexis, it doesn't go away. Uh, JAWS, ZoomText is another competitor to JAWS. These are your ADA tools. Uh, AXE, Chrome extension, ADA tool as well. Adobe Creative Suite as we talked about it. Snagit, Snagit actually comes on our computers for free right now. You can do some easy mockups using Snagit. I am not a designer. I'm a pseudo developer and we use Snagit all the time to create images and things to show mockups and layouts and turn over to our dev team. Envision again, because it's an actual tool as, as well as a resource. 
lucid charts, canvas designs. If you want to create some easy peasy mockups or uh, designs. And then also I put on here understanding HTML, CSS and other languages. I am my basis is HTML and CSS. I can read XML, I can read PHP, I can read other languages because I know and understand HTML and CSS. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. I want to do one last plug. World Usability Day is November the 8th. And the Tampa Bay UX group is going to have a big day planned, a big event planned around it from 6.30 to 8.30 that we would love for you to be able to come out and enjoy. And if you want more information, they are on Meetup as well. And then there is the worldusabilityday.org website. Thank you. Um, I have Netflix. And I noticed this was uh, a couple of few months ago, I guess. <clears throat> I was looking around the site, and if you look up at the time, if you looked up classic movies, mm -hmm. there was a page, and with the rows, with different squares of images for the um, movies, and it, it made me laugh because there was no arrow to go any further mm -hmm. because they were aiming it at older people. So there was no uh, no no sliders. Just here's the page. page. Mm -hmm. Here's some pictures. Just click. Yeah. So I thought that was funny. They were aiming it, but they've changed it since then. Yeah, and they've, and also the other thing that they've done is that they changed their categories too. That was one of the things the guys talked about. He said that before there was something that one of the categories was kind of split and they found that it was unnecessary. So they consolidated some of their categories. Um, also, they're doing more AI predictive um, personalization for you so you'll see that get better as well um and it was quite interesting what they really did and they actually did a video if you go to their channel youtube channel you can see the video and exactly how they went through their entire design redesign process for the home page it was really good i'd like to find out how youtube does theirs because it keeps getting worse and worse <laughs> <laughs> yeah mm, well you yeah. <laughs> know yeah, I mean, for being a Google, that's Google. For being a Google product, it just seems yeah. really odd how it's it just keeps going the wrong direction. Yeah, I I think what Google and I, I heard this from somebody else. Google wants to be the place of first choice for information, and so now with video and voice coming the way it is, I think that's going to change. You you you'll see a change. It's it's not no longer going to be as much of the wild wild west. Yeah. Is it My, is. I think the thing that bothers me the most is anytime that any app, any web application like Facebook and Instagram starting to do it now, and YouTube is doing it now too, where you'll have like a screen that has your recommendations, and you'll be on there, and you'll watch one, and you'll go, you know, it's taking up your full screen, you go back. And all of a sudden, your entire list of recommendation changes. Yes. And mm -hmm. where does I wanted the one that was right next to it, and it's gone now, and I yeah. can never find it again. <laughs> yeah, and, that's that's uh, good old that's that, that good old AI behind the scenes. That's no AI. I don't want that. That's, <laughs> that's that predictive modeling. Uh, do you have any recommendations on how to kind of get more of a group to be willing to do your user research and surveying? Uh -huh. or free in particular because I know a lot of times you know you can use people in your company mm -hmm. to do your surveys but they might not be your target audience oh, yes. mm -hmm. so do you have any recommendations on corralling people for that and get an incentive in a way <laughs> yeah well there's there's actually several things you can do so typically what I do is I try to think of I try to think of associations uh, first so I try to think of what is my persona where would I find these people? And then if there are any groups first that I can piggyback on, because if they have, say for instance, they may have a group meeting one night and you were like, ooh, captive audience. If I supplied the food, I have a captive audience, right. you know, and they do, or uh, what we've done also in the past is that you can do small incentives. Uh, for instance, I'll give you an example of that diary study that we did for Ally. We were just looking at how do people use their mobile phones, pure and simple. And we said, okay, come in, 
one night we we kind of worked with a company to get the people, had them come in and we paid them or gave them a credit or something. And then we said, now, if you want to pe- be part of the diary study, that's a hundred dollars or hundred dollar Amazon gift card per person. And they were religious. And so once you track it, you know, you can track it. Then at the end um, at our company, it's a kind of big gift, but it's an incentive people do uh, for our rating and reviews. That's another u- uh, user uh, research that can that you can use. We ask people to submit in on a monthly basis, and once like once a quarter, we give them like a four hundred to win it a four hundred dollar gift card. Wow. You know, so you think about what it is that you're trying to test or sell, mm-hmm. and can you give that away for free? At, or at some type of get discounted price. Mm-hmm. Um, think about what is in your your tool chest that you can work off of. Um, when I was a student in college, I had I needed to survey uh, some uh, uh, what was it uh, travel agents on the West Coast. And I sent out an email back then, you know, it was still rudimentary. I sent out an email to uh, a, a travel agent and they I actually got a couple of responses back. But I explained to them what I was trying to do. And I offered to share the data from my research back to them because I was looking at um, West Coast travel or, or how to get people. That's the information they're interested in. If I can get a study for free, most white papers now are at a minimal $400. So if I can get your information for free at no cost and use it to my business, or I can work with you to tell you how to apply it to your business, people will are responsive to that. Just like I was saying, um, you know, if you have something you're concerned about your site in the blind, go to the Association of the Blind of, I don't know if it's St. Pete or whatever, Tampa Bay, and talk to them. They're more than willing to work with you because they want that. And then they can be, they can turn around and sell your site to other people and say, hey, that is a great site. They came and tested with us, you know, that type of thing as well. So think about what's in your tool chest and what you can, I do associations. That's what I, I tend okay. to do, word associations when I say associations. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I found it really interesting when you said about videos, like videos, it's about like engaging your customers. Mm-hmm. Like uh, today I was, uh, this morning I was looking for for free tutorials on YouTube mm-hmm. uh, for coding stuff. And then a guy offered like uh, a free course of Angular, uh, like two hours mm-hmm. uh, to make, to make like a amazing app and then after that like oh they want to finish the the rest of the project, project yeah. yeah bye bye My yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he sucked he got the, he used what was in his tool chest which yeah. was his knowledge he sucked you in with the beginning he got you halfway there and you was like i want to finish this <laughs> and say well pay me yeah. <laughs> pay me to finish and that's what he did so that's it, exactly um the other thing about video which is really mm-hmm. interesting before videos used to have to be short and sweet they had to be quick now if you put a video on your web on your front page of your website i would be like yes make those short make those introductory kind of just draw you in type of videos but your how-to videos can be as long as they need to be now because youtube and Vimeo, to a certain extent, has set that standard that you can put two hours worth of video out on the platform now and not be so much dinged for it as you used to be before. So, you know, and then also the other thing is with your videos, because of SEO, make them descriptive. When you're talking, going back to content, make it descriptive that, that people want to, when they type in, I want rise angular video, they can be able to land on it really quick. It comes up first page, below the, above the fold, this type of thing. Also voice, um, not particularly, it's UX related. Um, a voice <laughs> is coming with Google because uh, they're introducing a basic syntax on how you structure your questions and answers. Uh, the best way to think of it is your Q and A's. Uh, if you have what is WordPress, um, WordPress Tampa, have a straight short description because what's coming within the next six months into the year, they're saying feed us 
the predictive information and then we will spit it out and regurgitate back to your the users and if you can go ahead and build that into your site or build that start building that into your app even uh the specialist said think of the one thing that you want people to know most about your business or your site and build that into so if it's the number one restaurant in saint pete you add that to it and it will do your world good so where you heard people were saying oh i was first on sel so i'm at the top i get all these hits and businesses now think of the same thing with voice that's the next major search engine and they they hadn't landed on the acronym yet they're using vo right now voice optimization uh, but that's coming. So I would say between those two, think, think, start thinking ahead. And as you build in new features and functions into your site, start thinking about those things and how you can incorporate it. Do you mean, do you mean posting audio? What do you mean? Like, no, no. Audio clips? No, no. So uh, right now, all of our phones are equipped with uh, a microphone. So you speak into it and you say, number one restaurant, Tampa Bay. And it's search for that, but it's doing it by voice. You're not typing it in anymore. Your website should be able to handle that. Your website should say, uh, and I don't have, they haven't come out with the exact diagram for it, but it's basically syntax. Question, number one restaurant is Tampa Bay. The response is Kell's Diner is the response. And so when people speak into their phone or say Alexa, Number one restaurant in Tampa Bay, Kell's Diner, or you have five results. That's the evolution of voice, because right now one in, two, one, in, one in four, 25% of the U.S. market has some type of voice device in their home now. Yeah, they're all doing the Google Home thing where they yeah. ask the Google thing, what the, what's the answer to this or what's the answer exactly. to that. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. So it's evolving and what Google is saying, is, what Google is saying to us is instead of us telling you what that answer is, you tell us. We're going to build a predictive model that's going to, AI, that's the one to start feeding and churning all of that and the results are coming up. So instead of seeing the first page results, as you do now on a website, it's going to speak back to you have five results. You have 10 results. Then you say, give me number one, and it is spit it off. Number one, brief, uh, and it's not, it is all organic right now. That's the other key thing. Get in while it's still organic, because once it go to paid, it's going to be paid, just like AdWords. AdWords were all organic at first, and then they became monetized. You're saying like put that number one thing in, like well, I still don't understand how it relates. Yeah, so so what it is is it's actually like I said, I don't have the exact structure yet because they hadn't totally released it. Only though I'm not a voice person, but they actually have a framework that says for voice, just like for mobile, you know, how your site rechanges itself for mobile is going to do the same thing on the back end. This is all back end coding that says voice question equals answer like that okay. that's what i'm saying i'm sorry if i wasn't clear in the beginning no it's structured more like a frequently asked question yes okay. yes and that's exactly what i i was talking to him and he was saying yes think of your q and a's whatever your fk f aqs are on your site to start thinking those are easy things to convert but as you build content as you build videos those type of things you're going to need to start thinking long term about those as well as well but right now it's purely like a q a type what's the question here's the answer type that of actually kind of makes sense because when you think about it when you're actually searching that's what people are actually doing they're asking the question mm -hmm. and so your website your content that's being if you've got it properly is that, up, mm -hmm. that exactly and that's why they're saying is the next evolution of seo but they're not going to call it seo they're actually going to call it voice optimization or a voice engine optimization yes um however that that phrase that people are using now for Alexa and voice uh pizza near me i looked that up and that is directly with google my business whether you are on that or not hmm. local so that's where that's going to, you're going to get picked up 
not from your website necessarily, but from Google My Business. Makes sense too. Yeah, well, it is Google that's driving it. Um, I'm quite sure Apple is going to have a response <laughs> to it um, because it is using your native, uh, the native app uh, tool that is on your phone, so your voice tool. So I'm not, I, like I said, I'm not an Apple person. So they try to build. Um, when Google Maps came out, Apple tried to build their map tool. It didn't do well, so now they tell people to use Google Maps. But I'm quite sure Apple is looking at it. They bought a company and they have optimized and. and I'm not an Apple person, so I can't and preach and Apple. And there's, and there's not any <laughs> yeah, but yeah, no. A company and they've changed it over time, like anything else. Yeah, so they're going to get back to saying no, don't use an Android too. You know, Google is Android, and then Apple is iOS. So, however you want to use it. Any other questions? Um, sure. Yeah, I've got a question. So, uh, one of the big problems that we have when we're doing UX design testing is. A lot of these tools massively slow down the page load time. Is there, and I, I'm, I know you can load scripts asynchronously, and there's a couple other things that you can do, but have you have you heard of any kind of strategies or anything that is used to kind of combat that? From my experience, we almost built a subdomain and run the test to get it to go faster. And then once it was ready and tested out, moved it up into the production, full scale production environment. Your staging environment just typically is slower anyway. Um, but that's kind of, we did a subdomain. So we tell people go here, test it, and then we can shut it down and not people have people see it after the fact. Um, a lot of our testing before we even got to the mock-up, we did a lot of paper-based testing with our users um, and said, how, how would you flow through? What would you expect um, type of thing before we got to the full-scale uh, site design? So- Are you I, talking about like the A-B testing and stuff like that? Yeah, because we'll, we'll uh, A-B test, it, they're all e-commerce sites, we'll A-B test uh, web pages, um, but because the web, like without a lot of these scripts on web pages, the page will load in under a second, but with them, it'll, you know, two to three seconds. So the behavior obviously changes yeah. just because the page is taken. So I would say, what tools are you using, if you don't mind sharing? Um, you know, there, there's quite, like, Hot Yarn would be the one that we probably use more than anything. Okay. Um, and we're, and we're doing the screen recording so that we can actually see what people are doing. Do we can actually see. Okay. That people are leaving because it just takes a damn long to load. Load. Um, but the, you know, the insight that we get from it is very valuable. Only like the heat maps are, the heat maps are actually part of Google Analytics. Yeah, that's what yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, but they, but you know, most of, even if we, even if we load scripts asynchronously and we load it from, uh, there's a bunch of different ways that we can load it. It still will take about a second longer to load. And while that doesn't sound like it very much, I mean, it just has a huge impact. Yeah. So, anyways, no, no, no. It's a valid question. Uh, like I said, I'm uh, from the testing standpoint. What I've seen in the past, and what we've done in the past, we set up a dummy environment that's in production with a subdomain on it, and then that way, it uh, you don't necessarily run into those things because the way the scripts are put in on the back end, it loads as if. And then also, uh, are you looking at your how you're lazy loading things onto it? So that's that's how we've done it in the past. Um, I've never technically set it up, so I couldn't go into the details of how our dev team our, our dev team did it from a truly technical dive. But that's what I've always said. That's what we did. If you have the capacity to do that. Okay. Have you heard of Optimizely? I have. Yeah. It's depending on how much you're giving to your client, has it spend, it can get pretty pricey to use it. But um, they offer. It's Google Analytics on steroids. Basically, you can do everything you need to from that area, and you never really had problems with it loading slowly or anything. So, I would recommend looking into that. It's very, very, very in depth of a program. Like I said, it can be kind of pricey, but it's a very good tool for all that AP testing and everything you can do. Okay. 
Okay. Well, since you guys were such a wonderful audience, I work at a beauty wholesaler. I have some goodies for you tonight. <laughs> You have just watched a recorded presentation from our WordPress St. Petersburg meetup. We meet twice a month on the first and the third Tuesdays in downtown St. Pete at the Suncoast Developers Guild. If you enjoyed this presentation and found it useful, please give it a thumbs up in YouTube and be sure to subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell to be notified when new videos are added. You can find out more about WordPress St. Petersburg at our website at tampabaywp.org and at our meetup site at meetup.com slash WordPress St. Petersburg. Thanks.